Hey folks, I think I owe you guys an explanation. Firstly, yes, the lapel mic experiment did go a little bit haywire. That's why I'm holding it in my hand this week. The most annoying part though was that I actually had Audacity recording backup audio and it turned out it was recording my laptop's built-in microphone which sounded worse than what the lapel mic had recorded. Basically I'll find out at the end of the recording if this is any good or not. I have actually got the backup working this time. Because I want to get these reviews out to you guys in a timely manner, I felt it a waste of time recording it all again. I had some really good takes and I had already put off recording the video for way too long last week, so that's why the review sounded so awful. Secondly, my interpretation of last week's episode. You know, that it was all a dream. Uh, it was pretty unfounded. If only I could go back in time and hit control F on that script and replace the word dream with alternative timeline, I think we all would have been a bit happier. I think I conflated the dreamlike qualities of that episode with it actually being a dream, which it evidently wasn't because one, we don't see Ruby wake up or fall asleep, and two, the pair have slightly different dialogue in the opening and closing closing scenes. I attributed this explanation to the amount of nonsense that occurs in the episode, but I think the alternative timeline explanation serves this function equally well. Lesson learned, never assume anything. Take what you will from that, I still enjoyed the episode for the most part. Now, without further ado, uh, let's move on to talking about another episode that I quite enjoyed for the most part. Let's start with the concept. Dot and Bubble is Doctor Who's Eat the Rich episode. It's clearly a reflection on the modern tendency of people surrounding themselves with social media. Dot and Bubble and Spike. A world where people basically live stream to each other during every waking hour, removing the need for physical connection with other human beings. The idea of a social media bubble physically represented with a floating mechanical device projecting onto their faces called a dot. This creates a form of augmented reality for the characters. Wait, I'm sorry, how isn't this a Black Mirror episode already? Literally the first note I wrote for this script was Oh my god, it's Nosedive! There's clearly some association with that episode because of the way that Lindy, this episode's main character, swipes away those with lower subscriber counts, as though she were batting away a fly or something. And also, Lindy? Lacey? Lindy? Lacey? Such a wacky concept is taken to an absolute extreme, in that the people of this world are being eaten alive by aliens because they literally cannot see their hands in front of their faces. Or rather, they can, but choose not to. I am not lowering my bubble. I was reminded of both 28 Days Later and Day of the Triffids, with a character waking up in the apocalypse because they were asleep the whole time. Here though, the characters voluntarily enter into a form of blindness thanks to a dependence on their technology. Previously in this series, a child character was depicted reliving memories of her father whilst the whole planet was about to explode. This episode seemingly takes that hilarious concept and creates a whole world around them. In this location, called home time, home time, fine time. Characters from the age of 17 to 27 all coexist far away from their parents who live on a place called Homeworld. All the major players in this story are concisely introduced in the first three minutes, with the Doctor taking the position of the overly protective father figure trying to invade Lindy's private space. Obviously he's trying to do the right thing by getting her to a place of safety, but finds himself blocked in favour of doing a toothbrush TikTok dance. The episode also shows us these wonderful exterior shots of a city that is protected by a bubble-like dome. We see a news broadcast projected onto the city walls, which I thought was interesting considering the kids living here have probably never even looked at it. Perhaps this was a concept the parents on Homeworld thought the kids would really like, only to realise too late that young people would rather just gossip about the world around them instead of knowing about it. They would rather use an app like Ground News, the sponsor of this week's video. Uh, can... Can you check for me? Uh, is there anything in the video description? 
like I don't know a, a, a hyperlink or click here or something no guess we didn't get sponsored this week <laughs> Anyway, the young adults of this world work for a grand total of two hours a day in an office which ultimately winds up merely being an excuse for them to recharge their Dot's batteries. Ruby then attempts to intervene with Lindy's bubble, acting far more professionally than the Doctor could. Considering Ruby falls into the age range of fine time, I think this explains why she didn't pop up with the same unsolicited request border that the super old Time Lord has. I really enjoyed the initial restraint show when Lindy looked to her right, where her missing colleague was being consumed. The sound of the slippery, hungry monster was really nice, but I think they might have let the cat out of the bag a little early by having Lindy lower her bubble. Fortunately, the eerie score from big man Murray Gold, the horror of a pair of legs sticking out of this slug-like alien, I was beaming like a little child. The man traps just looked awesome. Props to them not just being visual effects as well. They were handcrafted for the most part to give the actors something to interact with. This probably stems from the unbridled imagination of Russell T Davies. Do you guys know he does illustrations to accompany his scripts? These are wild, man. Speaking of imagination, big shout out to that random character named Dr. P. Remember, don't waste the day with daily waste. This episode is just filled with hilarious little gags like this one. Things just got more excellent as the episode introduced Lindy's dependence on her bubble. The repression of her fight or flight response demonstrated by her instinctually playing her favorite boy dancer Ricky September when she was in danger, followed by her inability to walk. I don't know how to walk. What do you mean? I don't know how to walk without the arrows. You don't know how to walk without the arrows. Oh my god, I was howling with laughter. This did genuinely remind me of how dependent I am on apps like Google Maps and Naver Maps. Obviously it's not to such an extreme that I can't even walk, but I would be hopeless trying to get anywhere in the cities that I've lived without these apps. Unfortunately I thought this joke outstayed its welcome somewhat when Lindy was wandering the streets and... Forward. Walked into a street lamp? Not once twice? The navigation leads her into an elevator with one of the man traps which I genuinely gasped at. It was a shame we were left to imagine the monster moving out of the elevator because the camera is so tightly crammed into Lindy's face, leaving me confused and thinking the monster had just disappeared. She then goes outside to see everyone in her world being consumed by these aliens. It looks like they filmed the whole thing on a university campus or something and the guy getting swallowed feet first was a terrific Sight. Uh, sorry, we'll save that for later. Oh, Russell, you f tease. The Doctor comes back into Lindy's bubble where we see that the sonic screwdriver can override muting and blocking just nicely. Parents in reality wish they had this kind of power over their children's technology. This causes Lindy to open a big group chat with all of her friends which just reminded me of the days of MSN Messenger when somebody could just start a group chat and then start nudging. Ah, those were the days. I feel like I'm holding a cigar or something. <laughs> This group chat essentially allows the Doctor to instruct everyone in fine time to get underground and into relative safety. Before that can happen though, Lindy's dot runs out of power and she's left to the mercy of the streets. This was where she met her safety symbol Ricky September who is literally my inspiration. I open the bubble, drop my songs and then I turn the dot off for the rest of the day. You're wild. I know. I just stay in my apartment and Read. All the quick fire flirting directed towards him was hilarious too. He seemed like such a sweetheart. The only person in fine time that wasn't a complete moron. His only flaw was how he insisted on keeping certain horrors from Lindy's view. Both the sight of a man trap and the entire homeworld becoming bug feed too. Man alive, what a dilemma. Obviously you don't want somebody to be driven insane by hopelessness, but his dishonesty was ultimately a red herring for how I 
felt towards the character. I thought a bigger betrayal from him was going to come. The whole time he was punching in numbers, I thought he was taking Lindy to a room where a big hungry bug was waiting or something. Turns out, the betrayal came from Lindy instead, who literally threw the sexiest guy she's ever met under the bus just to save her own neck. Hashtag justice for Ricky, am I right guys? I loved this characterization of Lindy, the person we've been following this entire episode, turning out to not only be as shallow as she initially appeared, but she's entirely selfish as well. I really appreciated Ricky's rather shocking death too. Sadly though, this was where the episode started to nag at me, and I need to rewind a bit to explain a few things. You see, Lindy betraying Ricky is the third time she'd escaped from mortal danger, thanks to a series of bizarre reveals. The first being that the dot and bubble technology had gained sentience and decided to hate everyone in fine time and homeworld. The second is that the bugs were somehow created by said technology, consuming the folks of fine time in alphabetical order, meaning those with surnames beginning with A were eaten first and those with Z would be eaten last. When the first reveal came, the dot started shining a red light on Lindy before attempting to kill her. Remember kids, there's a fly in my face. <laughs> Remember kids, red light means danger. I don't know why other dots weren't shown to turn red whilst other people were being eaten. With the second reveal, Lindy becomes next in line to be killed because of her surname. She then screams out that Ricky September's surname is an alias, something apparently the super intelligent dot AI that can create an entire alien species didn't know about. Not only does the whole A to Z death list thing give Lindy a silly amount of plot immunity, but also... It's a powerful anti-grav cycle combination device. If it wants you dead, it can kill you itself. If the dots could kill everyone themselves, why did it bother creating an army of slugs? Lindy makes it down to the cellar where loads of other survivors are seen running around preparing to leave on this boat thing. Word spread really fast apparently. How did this bugle girl manage to get down here faster than Lindy? The Doctor and Ruby are here waiting to greet her and more questions flooded my brain. How did the Doctor and Ruby get roped into helping find time? How were they able to communicate with Lindy? Did they have their own dot? The pair were a short walk away from opening up the door on the other side with the sonic screwdriver and instead insisted on Ricky opening it with this laboriously long number crunching process. Bruce Cavendish, we haven't got titles yet but if the role of leader was up for grabs I guess I'd myself would. I'm sorry, who the f*** was this guy? Clearly this was a character they introduced way too late into the story. Like, he's even named. Weirdly, instead of just hiding in safety from the monsters above, this lot all wanted to go out into the wild woods beyond the city walls. We're told from day one, never touch the wild woods. Well, so much for that. Logically, the Doctor offers them a trip off-world to another planet so they can live in relative safety. I did actually appreciate that the Doctor's offer was met with some skepticism. For once, people not immediately believing that the Doctor has a time and space travelling machine was a very welcome change. The Doctor's reaction to this rejection was very interesting. I really liked that the overly protective, condescending parental vibes the Doctor gave off throughout the episode had some payoff. The Doctor couldn't save them all from the fate that's waiting for them outside, forced into a corner where his god complex is in fact an outdated idea that was better suited to the Doctor that he by generated out of. It was great that this episode left such a sour taste in my mouth, once again reflecting a scenario where the Doctor cannot be entirely in control of the situation. I hope this has repercussions for the Doctor's decisions in the final three episodes because I think we have the makings of a great Doctor coming our way. Oh, my interpretation turned out to be, once again, completely wrong. wrong! After I watched Doctor Who Unleashed for this episode, the cast and crew handed this episode's real conclusion to us on a silver platter. You probably do realise it in the app, but it's the moment when we look around and everyone is white, and you're just like, 
The Doctor gets rejected from helping these people, not from natural scepticism or breaking free of parental constraints, but because they're a bunch of racists. Because you, sir, are not one of us. Screen to screen contact is just about acceptable, but in person, that's impossible. That's for you, Dick. We shall turn away, ladies, before we contaminate it. I did appreciate that none of their dialogue was very overt. I don't imagine these kind of racists would outright call a spade a spade. Like, I'm really glad that Ruby didn't just blurt out, oh my god, they're all white. Like, it would have been so cringy. If this were the Chibnall era, Yaz would definitely have said something to that tune. At the same time, it's not an idea that had any real build-up. Had this wannabe leader character been introduced earlier, I could totally see this reveal working better. And I say this because I know that there are people who watched this episode that didn't get this impression or understand why the Doctor reacts the way he does. I came away from this episode thinking the Doctor had an overreaction to people rejecting his offer. And in fairness, I still think it's a bit of an overreaction considering these kids aren't racist in the same same way that, say, the Daleks are. The outburst is definitely a good demonstration of Shuti Gatwa's ability to perform. It's just another unfortunate example of writing that is incapable of supporting his talent. We're over halfway into the series, and I still don't know what this Doctor is all about. Gatwa has really been done dirty by the show so far. So, did it suck? It's happened again, folks. Another episode that felt great, but after closer examination, it's a bit flawed. At first, the episode poses a real threat and allows for tension to be maintained. The character journey of an awful character was a refreshing take, and having the Doctor and Companion aiding her on the sidelines worked just as well as it did back in the episode Blink. The music was great, the man traps were good, it's just a shame that the story was made a bit more complex than it needed to be. I thought the jabs at young people's social media addictions made for some great laughs, and Ricky September was a fantastic little inclusion too. I did appreciate that this episode essentially exists in isolation to everything else in the Hooniverse, but we needed more details about how the Doctor and Ruby got involved in this mess. The ending was definitely unexpected, and I appreciated it. I give Dot and Bubble a 7 out of 10. Again.